morning, everyone. Um, my name is Kevin O'Brien. I'm also a descendant of the Kauri and Miriam people from far north Queensland. Um, so I start by acknowledging the country we're on and all of you here today, as well as any elders present. Um, as we said, I'm an architect, so I'm slightly out of my space here with historians, but I'm slightly more useful than economists. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michelle called recently and told me about this really important uh, symposium. She mentioned that there might be a, a commissioner in terms of architecture, so I couldn't help myself. <laughs> but what I want to show you is a piece of work, um, just coming at topics slightly uh, from a different angle. Um, one of the other hats I wear as a partner in a, a practice called BBN. Um, the spectrum of the partners is 350 staff, so we're quite a big commercial group in Sydney, Brisbane, New York, and London. Um, but my partners have given me full support over the last five or six years since I've been a member um, to develop a framework for our practice to, to think about things. And a lot of that's based on those two books that Louise mentioned, Our Voices. And even though I'm trained as an architect, my actual area of um, interest is the relationship between the architecture and people. Um, and specifically when in the cultural context, it's um, Aboriginal people. So I guess most of you are all familiar with this map, um, but you have to imagine when I'm walking into a room full of consultants and prospective clients, there could be 20 to 30 people and I'm typically, if not um, always, the only um, First Nations person in that room. And more often than not, I see fear in people's eyes because they're not quite sure where I'm going to go with um, whatever the project is. And talking about big projects, these are sort of multi hundreds of million dollars of projects. So um, culture is always a bit of a sore point when you're in a, a very strict mercantile setting. So even getting this sort of drawing up that um, you know, is describing um, all the nations around Australia and what that means in terms of a starting point is can be a bit of a, a, a step too far for some for some people in those kinds of settings. But what I'm trying to get it to um, really quickly with uh, those kinds of meetings is to take some of that fear away and sort of talk to them about uh, these layers of influence that might affect the project. Now, I'm sure you're aware of uh, the writings of someone like Noel Pearson who's talked about uh, these particular kinds of um, socio-historical um, points in the Australian timeline. Um, I guess my, my view of that is in the way that when we're looking at a built project, which is really the pointy end of the Torrance title, so if you think of the line on a page drawn in London is imaginary, once you get to a building that's absolutely um, obsessed with it, um, it becomes a very, uh, I feel like we're at the we're on our own frontier, I guess, as architects in that space. But in those rooms, I talk about the First Nations influence, um, and particularly trying to get down to this idea of what it means to belong to something as opposed to own it, which again puts me in contest with the, with the Torrance title idea. And then when we talk to the colonial, I really have to step and choose my words carefully in those meetings, because the thing I can only talk to is infrastructure. And that's the big thing about the Torrance title. It ultimately tells you as an architect where you can put your toilet. Um, when we get to the multicultural, I can look at the post-1960s, and that typically captures the rest of the room. And we can talk to the philosophies and the other ideas that came from around the globe. So what I'm saying, in terms of looking over our shoulder, if you look at the black layer here, where the project's located, surely we would draw from all of those layers in the making of the project. We draw on all the ideas, all the possibilities that are in that. Um, the subtext is that some of those things are uncomfortable. Um, the text people are hearing in those rooms is that there's comfortable points to connect on. Surely we're drawing all of those to make something that's of this place. The two things when we look forward or into the future is that um, I'm sure you can read that, but the next layer above is to do with technology and the manner we uh, engage in any kind of technical revolution within that building or architecture, it's already on its first day of becoming obsolete. So the next thing's always just over the horizon. 
And then finally, with any of these sorts of projects that we're doing, um, um, we have to position them globally. We have to look out around the world and see uh, where the benchmark is, what is it we're attaining to. So part of um, then uncovering how to better understand that First Nations layer is that um, we do a piece of work and the New South Wales government has released a discussion paper on this called Connecting with Country. And the purpose of it is to, um, irrespective of whether it's a hospital or a multi-residence, multi-residential project, that there has to be some kind of connection and engagement with the local community of that place. Now, they're quite ambitious words. Um, and another drawing that I'm working on is clearly indicating that there's a sliding scale of interest in that, and there's a sliding scale of benefit back to community. So in the case of, say, a community-led project like an education centre that we finished in Mount Druitt years ago, it was 100% community engagement because it was with the community and it was for that community. At the other end, um, there's some multi residents multi residential projects we're doing, I uh, can't say where, but the developers have no interest in the community and they're being dragged into this forum. But equally, there's no community benefit either, and the community's not that interested in talk. To them. Um, the brain level I've got around that, and I need to take this up with the New South Wales Land Councils, is this idea of the Land Councils are the sort of um, legislated custodians of uh, well, protection of that culture in those regions um, is that the first point of call for these developer types. Do they have to engage on the most basic of levels? So it's a conversation to be had. But what I've been thinking over the last period of life, so I'm almost 50, is that my understanding of community, when it's um, thought about, or certainly from my experience, is that at the centre always is the elders of the country you're standing on. It's inescapable. And you sort of radiate that, you know, pebble in the pond style back to the perimeter. Um, so within that, um, you know, around the elders is the, the local um, guess, Costco custodians of that particular country. And there's others who live in that community or part of it. And then you move to the stakeholder community, which for me is typically on that client side. So if it is a hospital, there'll be Aboriginal members who work within that particular service who may be part of the first local. Um, outside of that, uh, there are other people that are from the national community, and then um, conversations I have with people over in Etera and uh, North America, this international community. So this, this drawing's been coming for a while because um, as an architect practicing, I tend to come up against a lot of people who are influencers into my industry. And they tend to weaponize the idea of community and who's in it and who isn't. Um, and um, this has sort of given me some clarity to be able to put um, forward an alternative way of seeing it. So, so what do we do as architects with that? So in our practice at least, we then take, and that is the first step before we do talk to anyone, uh, we attempt to research in a way that we're trained, which is not in any way as strict as most of the historians in this room. Um, but a number of us do have first graduate degrees from uh, various places, so we, we believe we do know that research. And we have two types of research in order to understand that country better before we turn up. One of them is just strictly in the geography. It's a very objective piece of, of research. And the reason for that is because we, we need to better understand um, not the character of the place or its history, but the conditions of, the, of that place that we're building in. So we start with what we're standing on, which is the geology. And then we look at the hydrology, how water performs on it. Then we're able to better understand the kind of form of that supports, and then in turn the form. So what we've done is build an objective um, a picture of, of what that building belongs to. That's a very different process to how we were taught at university, where the first thing we picked up was book to do with an architect from Europe or North America and there's very little to do with people, it's actually about the, the building in isolation. The second part which is obviously much more subjective in the domain of anthropologists um, 
and we do get assistance on occasion, it is starting to build up our own understanding of that country. Um, now this is helping me be better informed when I go into those projects and also the other architects in a practice. We start with country, we look at the language, we try to get an understanding of that language, we try to understand the significant sites, build up a picture of the traditional practices, and then also um, look for that colonisation, the effects of the colonisation and what, what the, um, I guess, the, um, the effects of that are within that community. More often than not, all of the records we're looking at that, because this is all desktop research, uh, are not written or put forward by Aboriginal people. Um, and the reason we have that community diagram before is that um, those conversations sort of become the key part of understanding that picture and much rounder full away. So all that builds up all the prompts that we need as architects and we're able to take that. And I'm adamantly against buildings that are about um, reflecting symbolically at least what they think a sense of Aboriginality is. Um, things that are only to do with uh, the image of the project. So in my view, um, architecture has to think about these three things. So one is the setting. So we have to articulate the space or the spaces with people and how people will use them, what they'll be oriented towards, what they see, what's the prospect, how they how you relate to people within those spaces. That, that's a fundamental role of an architect to do that. The second then is to understand what the palette is, what are the materials. Now the research previously gives us a bit of a sense of that. We're able to think in terms of the flora, um, we can even think from that floor through the timbers, we might be able to, to specify it, even through the geology, the rocks, all those sorts of things. The final one is caring for country, and that, that by the um, names goes, is an idea about sustainability and how to, to reduce carbon and energy uh, usage in these buildings. Um, we're nowhere near hitting neutral as an ambition in Australia, just like what we uh, have there. The Building Code of Australia operates at a um, negative um, carbon and a negative um, energy position. So there's all these other uh, ideas that are out there that are trying to get us not just to uh, sort of an equilibrium but into a positive realm. So for character country, in my view, we have to look at it in three ways. One is what we've done in the past. So, so therefore, what can we do with that site to heal it? Now, example is you know, a building in the city that's been concreted, we've literally killed the um, endemic landscape. So can you bring back that endemic landscape and distribute it over the, the scale of the building? Um, the present is obviously to do with how we're going to make those buildings and reduce the energy and carbon in the making of them. Then the future is very much about how do we aim for that um, positive carbon, positive energy outcome. So in terms of just two, maybe three quick examples, um, we are working with some pretty forward-minded clients, I believe. One of them is Atlassian, which project when it was worth um, quite a lot of money down there in Central Station, or above Central Station. Um, this idea of uh, healing the country was that um, every fourth level is a garden. Um, that's allowed us to have a four-to-one ratio in terms of the site coverage. So yes, it's stripped. How can we do it in terms of um, the intersection of those layers of influence and bring back more than what was taken? So there's a series of gardens go all the way to the top of this building, and that's where you're working. Fantastic client, it's great university. <laughs> Soon to be renamed. Um, <laughs> so this is a new uh, education building for showing competition for and Again, this is a really simple project about healing country. This is aiming for um, positive carbon and energy usage. It's just over the Nathan campus. And then one of the things we're trying to do in terms of the setting, and we have massive support from the university around this, these ideas, is that in the section there's just a very uh, simple analogy made with the idea of the track. And on the track you make memories of the stopping points historically you would have camped or had a particular rituals and these things that become memorable experiences. This is my sort of version of a, a song line in a very, very basic way. And the way you track up through this building, you go across it, 
I bet the wrong at and it pop you out into certain places where you have these prospects out into country. So on the right hand side of that section you're looking once you get to the top level you're looking straight down um, south towards the border and you see in the border by about one distance and it makes sense as you move from the ground up you see what's immediately in front of you what's between you know, sort of the mid ground and then the far ground so you get to see the horizon so we're working with all this within the group the university um, reference group to help identify those places so we can show those prospects um, this one is finished with another architecture um, and it's just up at Dutton Park, um, it's a new Brisbane South State Secondary College. Uh, now we weren't asked to in any way bring these ideas of working with country and, and the community into this project, but it's kind of a free thing if I'm involved with the project you just get it. <laughs> <laughs> and some really simple things, so that research sort of popped out some really, really obvious things about that ridge line that runs from the school around to the jail. When we looked into the history of the site, the camping grounds, there used to be the scoring of instruments, the weaving of the tool of wood and these other plants. We're obviously a really basic but quite effective strategy about how we'd make the spaces, which are these big sort of spaces to do shelter, but also right down even into the finer detail of marking concrete as far as we start to think about how we do on scale of material. All the landscape is endemic species from that ridge. And um, one of the interesting things in the reading of the history was that the first industry in the jail uh, was weaving. And so we found it interesting. So we put, we put that word weaving in front of architects and they tend to celebrate because it can mean a lot of things. Uh, so for um, me, it meant uh, some Australians and sunshades. So it's just an idea of how you can start to think about the origin of an idea coming out of that country as opposed to a book and architectural around the, the other side of the board. Just to finish off where I'm going with all this stuff, and this is the big bit of work, um, probably getting more traction with the New South Wales, to be honest, is this idea of, of agency. And what we're finding in the industry that I'm part of is that all of these circles of, of, of entities that you need to make a building, there's a lot of different groups. There's consultants, there's community, there's clients, specialists, all of them all the stuff you can see. So all those groups have contracts between them that determine not just your behaviour but what you deliver and what you'll do. And if you get it wrong, then you get to meet their lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> but the more, um, over the last 25 years, I've got to see more and more Aboriginal people turn up in all of these different circles. And what I'm finding is the projects that have more of that tend to operate in this other space, which is like a kind of um, um, it's not a mercantile space, it's uh, it's you belong to the side of the thing that you're responsible for. So, even though my son over here is the architect, particularly the Mount Druitt project, for example, the builder was uh, the original building company and they took the idea to another level and their suppliers took it to another level, and um, it becomes a relational experience as opposed to a contractual one. That's good. So in terms of an agency, and this is my long run up to hopefully getting a commission for a frontier yeah. museum. Uh, <laughs> the, the idea is that um, you know, well, there it is. For projects with significant cultural credentials at stake, it follows an agency, and therefore agents of that culture should be included in leading roles from beginning to end. Um, so I don't want to be an influencer in that kind of project. I want to be the architect. Mm. A couple of quick examples, Daniel Lipskind, Holocaust Museum in Berlin, mm. you all know that project. Um, the architecture is very much about the social conditions uh, associated with trauma. Mm. So it puts you into uncomfortable spaces and makes you really, um, in a solemn way, mind you, it's not a matter of banging your hand in a drawer, but it's, it's very much, um, it's solemn, it's painful, and it's, um, it, it's memorable. Mm. Uh, the second is the great um, First Nation architect, Douglas Cardinal, um, National Museum of the American Indian in Washington. Got to spend a lot of time with him in the last 25 years, and he has um, 
often a number of profit buildings in that way he led them made the decisions on them he's, he hasn't been the guy sitting outside the tent um, with other projects led by non-Aboriginal architects which happens a lot a lot in Australia these particular projects absolutely celebrate uh, in their essence and their character the First Nations um, position finally a guy I've just uh, had a few bits of work with David O.J. Uh, it's the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History in Washington. Um, incredible architect, and also within this building, which I haven't visited yet, but uh, you know, read the drawings and read the experiences that people have had visiting. There's a sense that when you do drop down through this building, through the lifts, if any of you have been there, it's to replicate the idea of being inside of a ship's hull, but to reference directly into the the experience of um, slaves in those gullies. So that's where it leaves us now. So right now in Australia, there's very few of us as architects. There's three of us um, who are either side of 50 at the moment. Um, with three very separate types of practice. One with sole practitioner, one's um, done an arrangement with a large practice, and then myself. And we've come together to work on that um, NERA project in Canberra shortest and that we were winner, but there's also a whole other bunch of people. So what I guess what I'm arguing is that right now there's no project built in Australia of any cultural massive dimension, even the ones that are specifically directed at Aboriginal people, at Aboriginal people actually leading them as architects. So I'll leave my business card. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.